you don't build it in. It comes out of the ability of the system to adapt autonomously to a changing world. And so I think there's a deeper level of design and mechanism than has been discussed so far. Um, and maybe you disagree, but you know, it's all in the published literature. So um, I, I'm happy to discuss it, but I love the nature of the conversation. It, it's, you know, I, I thrive on hearing such things, but I don't think that concepts like information model the system knows help. In fact, I use the word information in the 1960s, and I realized, among other things, it's a non-local functional on the data. And if you're going to do biology, it's all local interactions, even if they're long-range local interactions. So I had to toss it away. And, and what came out of it, which has also been mentioned, I think maybe Michael mentioned it, is competition. How to design competitive, cooperative competitive systems. And then I never looked back. I never had to. And uh, the laws of competition are just mass action laws that can occur in neural and non-neural systems. And I pointed to non-neural systems where you have homologies of the same kind of competition that you find in neural systems. So I, let me just shut my mouth in a minute. I believe there's a universal developmental code for all cellular systems. And if if that sounds, you know, highfalutin, I, I don't think I've developed a universal development code. I've given a few examples. But I think that is a major task for a couple of generations of scientists who'll be here long after I'm gone. I'm an old man. Thank you. It's actually super interesting to see the areas where um, you and the other panelists align in the paradigmatic, perhaps, disagreements surrounding representationalism or cognitivism. So I'd like to give them an opportunity to respond. Um, because he may have to leave sometime soonish, I'd like to give Adam uh, a shake at maybe uh, answering and highlighting areas where you agree or perhaps disagree. And then I'll go to Dalton and Michael. Yeah, so I want to offer <clears throat> a perspective here, which is that what Stephen's saying and, and what I think the other panelists have been saying is not necessarily in contradiction for the most part. Um, the when I talk about goals, for example, those are always things that an observer infers about a system, right? We can't actually ask a cell and know for certain what its goals are, but we can see that if we put the same cell in a bunch of different situations and we see that it continues to act as though it's trying to, pers to pursue a particular state, then we would describe that as a goal. And so that allows for emergence. In fact, I think it necessitates emergence in multicellular systems under the specific scenarios in which the states that cells are trying to achieve are states that they cannot achieve on their own. Right? If, if I, for example, as a person have a goal, which is that my entire family be happy, that's something that I can't completely control on my own. If everyone in the family has the goal that the entire family be happy, then in a wide range of different situations, we're gonna all dynamically update our behavior in a way that gives rise to emergent characteristics, and I would say often resonant characteristics, we're going to be highly responsive to the other people in the family, but we don't, and no one of us has control. And so that, that sort of, uh, you know, view of things that goals are perceiver or observer dependent, nonetheless, that agents can pursue goals that are properties of the whole, as opposed to properties of themselves, or in addition to properties of themselves, it seems to license this sort of, uh, these transitions to emergence that appear in multicellular systems. It seems to give a mechanism for how that can happen, at least how we can reason about it. And once we have the, the some coarse grain state, you know, some system level summary statistic that we describe the parts as trying to achieve, not only do you get resonance, you know, sort of coming from that, you also get a causal emergence. That's the the kind of emergence that that we we often talk about. That is the Eric Hoyle model of that there's a way of course creating a system that predicts the future unfolding better 
than just looking at the parts. If the parts care about some coarse grain statistic of the whole, then that entails that that coarse grain statistic has causal power over the parts, right? If I care if my family is happy, then when my family is unhappy, my actions change. That means the family's happiness, an emergent statistic, has causal power over me as a part. So there's a there's this really nice bridge that's already being built between local goals, global goals that are held by local, you know, uh, individual components, emergence and resonance. And I agree with Stephen that this needs to be further developed. But I think the the, the blueprint is already coming into view. Could I could I add to your comments? Um, you know, if you have, <coughs> as I think you do in many biological systems, the ones I know a little about, broken symmetries and singularities that can trigger a cascade of developmental refinements, like in the development of a wing, for example, without there being an explicit goal. Um, you know, I think goal is another anthropomorphic word that helps us to think about it, but it's a good chapter heading or book title, but maybe not mechanistically instantiated. And I do believe that there is a top-down effect because without bottom-up, top-down matching, um, you know, the system wouldn't be dynamically stable in an un in a changing world, but you aren't given the top-down match as a prior. There's an adaptation bottom-up and top-down, and they, when the loop closes, they dynamically stabilize each other. So there's emergence without necessarily having a goal. And of course, when you do reductio ad absurdum, you say, well, how the hell did life start? And, you know, things get pretty religious. But given a certain substrate, this stuff just happens if you have enough nu nu nutrients and enough environmental constraints to energize it, I think. So, so, so could, I, could I maybe uh, just uh, add, add a little bit uh, to, this, uh, to this issue? So um, I, I, just uh, kind of to, to put a context on it. So, so my job, we, we work among other things in regenerative medicine. So our job is to communicate uh, whatever needs to, whatever signals need to be communicated to make the tissues grow limbs and eyes and hearts and rearrange the patterns how they need to be right so so what i'm about to say comes from experiments and successful examples of manipulating the pattern right so not so much, we do some modeling but but the more important part is like okay which, which of these which of these approaches are actually able to get these results that that are needed yeah so when i say there's a goal i mean the following thing we now actually have the ability to look at tissue and read out, we've developed the tools to read out the representation of the anatomical state that it is going to try to reach under various circumstances. We, we know this is what we're looking at because if we change, in, in a, it, and, and I can, I'll describe what, what it actually is, but we can change that pattern and without touching the genetics or really the hardware in any way, we don't manipulate the, the actual decision-making of the cells. All we have to do is change the, that representation and the entire system will now build something completely different, right? That is the only reason I call it a goal is because functionally, like on your thermostat, right? You don't need to know how the whole thing works. If you know how the target uh, state is encoded, you set it and let the system do what it does best, which is to reduce error to that state. So what we see in, in, in morphogenesis is, is the following. There is a bioelectrically encoded future pattern. We can, we can see it, we can decode it, at least in some, some cases, and we can alter it, we can rewrite it. Then what happens is there's a, uh, there's a stress mechanism that kicks in because the target state is, not is, is too far from the current anatomical state. So you go from, from um, a, a, a group of cells, you want to be a blastula. So there's a, there's a particular pattern. The stress goes up, and we can measure this. Okay, so we have measured, you know, we, can, we can actually see this happen. The stress goes up, the, t the temperature of the system goes up. Everybody tries to rearrange themselves to reduce that error. They do. The stress progressively goes down. But by the time they've done this, the bioelectrical pattern that indicates the goal state has moved on. 
It is now different yet again. Now it says, oh no, gastrula. And so, ah, oh, the stress goes up again. And the whole thing now reconfigures, tries to lower the, the stress goes down. But now, now, your neuro, now the pattern has moved on to be neurula. So there's a state of, there's a set of future states that actually pulls the stuff along, along and you can intervene and in, fun functionally, I and mean, we've, we've done all these experiments, you can intervene in many ways. You can rewrite the pattern and make them build something completely different. You can break the stress sensing, you can break the, the, um, uh, the you know, the stress minimization uh, process. You can, you can intervene in all these, all these parts, but basically, um, you're absolutely right in that it's it's non-local. It is absolutely non-local because the the stress spreads throughout the whole system, and oftentimes, in order to fix a problem at point A, you have to make many changes in point B. So the whole thing is absolutely non-local. The question of um, what it is, and and we know some about it, but we can have a nice long conversation about where the the the, the bioelectrical set points actually come from, right? So so that's interesting. But as far as um, as far as the the uh, the error minimization machinery is concerned there is a set point towards which they are trying to minimize error. That set point will change. And when it does, the whole thing starts to remodel again. But, but, uh, but all of, you know, th that, that idea of minimizing error to a set point is workable in these cases because we can read the set point, we can rewrite the set point, and without really doing anything to the hardware, we can sit back and watch, you know, uh, in the frog leg regeneration case, on the first day, we we tell it to to regenerate the leg and then we don't touch it again for a year and a half the whole thing will then autonomously go down that path for a year and a half because we were able to respecify the set point within anatomical morphous space that it's going to try to reach versus the the scarring uh, you know thing that it normally does and this is why we make eyes and limbs and hearts and and whatnot so i'll just i'll just say that it's, this is this is an empirical kind of uh, claim uh, thank you, Michael. I wanted to give Dalton a chance to respond as well to Stephen's point on non-stationarity, and I think it's a good segue given what you just discussed, Michael. So, Dalton, do you have some thoughts? Um, I I think that's lovely, and I don't think you've said anything that contradicts my remark, um, because it's you as a human who is noting that if these emergent properties uh, because of their context, uh, are going to go in a certain direction. But that doesn't mean it has to be explicitly, explicitly represented in the system itself. You know, it might be going toward a, an equilibrium state, um, but you're the one as a scientist who can try to measure and predict it. It doesn't have to be explicitly there. Or I don't see how it could be, but if you can show me data showing that it is explicitly represented in earlier states, as opposed to just being the context that drives it in one direction. And as you say, you change the context a little bit with a probe and it goes in a different direction. It's different context. Yeah, we'll have to, this, this will be a separate uh, discussion. I'm happy we're neighbors, look. Yeah, yeah. So Dalton, go ahead. Right. Um, well, I don't agree uh, that information is not a meaningful quantity uh, in time varying or non-equilibrium situations. And the reason why is because uh, there exist very well understood ways of doing inference about time dependent non equilibrium data. Um, one lovely example of this uh, goes all the way back to Jane's in the late 70s, uh, his theory of macroscopic prediction and um, maximum caliber, maximum path entropy, uh, was a way of making predictions about how the physics uh, of a system, where by physics I mean how do the constraints uh, applied on the system, how do they affect the information carried by a, uh, a distribution over an ensemble of possible trajectories. I think this is actually uh, quite, um, uh, let's say consistent with what Stephen was saying actually because um, the notion of information is, is uh, can be equivalently seen 
uh, through the lens of, of constraints.